Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archive classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Live from New York City, this is Wisdom of the Sages, your daily yoga podcast with me, Kastuba, your host today. Raghunath is on hiatus today, somewhere in Houston, Texas, but we do have Mara here, our executive producer. Good morning, Mara. Good morning. And uh, today we have a very special guest. Today is our interview day, which we generally do on Sundays. Uh, But before we get to our guest, Mara, do we have any announcements to make? A Bhakti Recovery Group meeting today at 9.30. Bhakti Recovery at 9.30. And? Um, I believe their shloka group meets right after the podcast as well at 9 o'clock. Okay, so if you want to learn shlokas, you write to wisdomthesages108 at gmail.com, and we will put you in the Chinanda Chandra shloka group where they are just becoming learned scholars, aren't they? You know, it's not all about becoming a big scholar, though, right? It's just like absorbing. Because <laughs> yeah, Mara's still, have you forgotten your one shloka yet? Yes. Or, okay, yeah. so we got we to gotta, we gotta, uh, get you going again on that. Now, little Karuna, our eight-year-old friend, she knows many shlokas. I think she knows about like 11 or 15 or something like that. Is that right? Mm-hmm. 21 something. She knows tons. Yeah. yeah, not that many, not 21, less than that, but she's still very good at it. But really, it's about absorbing your mind, where you, where you bring your mind, you know, it's and, and really, that's all that yoga is about. And especially in bhakti yoga, there's so many ways to bring your mind to spirit to God. And one of the most important ways we do that is through the cultural arts. And so our guest today uh, is a very special artist, a, a, a painter that was kind of trained directly under Srila Prabhupada to present bhakti through art, and her name is Driti, Driti Dasi. Driti Dasi, I want to welcome you to Wisdom of the Sages. It is a great honor to have you here today. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. <laughs> welcome. For inviting me. <laughs> it's, it's my pleasure. Now, I want to quickly read your bio here so people just learn a little bit more about you. Problem is, is where you're born, I have a hard time pronouncing. Born in 1957 in, say it for me. Wroclaw. Wroclaw. <laughs> Why don't they spell it that way? I don't know. Wroclaw, no. Poland. <laughs> <laughs> As Miriam Brooks, Driti Dasi was introduced to art at the age of five years old and later studied it formally at the Art Students League in New York City <clears throat> and at the School of Art and Design, also in Manhattan. After completing her graduation in 1975, she went to Los Angeles where she studied the artist at the studied where she joined the artist at the Bhaktivedanta Book Trust Art Studio. She stayed there for four years working on many projects, including the 24 volume series of the Chaitanya Charitamrita, a classic Gaudiya Vaishnava Bhakti text from India. Driti met her husband, Ramdas Abhiramdas, at the BBT Art Studios, where they worked on many pieces together. In 1979, they went to Florence, Italy together. They went to Florence, Italy, where Dritti headed the BBT art department. While in Italy, she studied at the Academy di Siena and began exhibiting her art, her work in Italy, France, and England. She returned to the United States in 1986 and began following the impressionistic style of painting. Her portrayal of figuration is skillful and evocative and vividly brings alive the featured narratives. Dritti's works are found in many private collections throughout the United States and Europe and she continues to work from her base in the U.S. 
So thank you so much for coming here, Jyoti. We have many questions to ask of you. Okay. <laughs> and we have, you're one, you're one of our very favorite artists. Before we even go further into this inter interview, because you want to get this information out right up front, I want to share with everyone where they can see, uh, and not only see, but purchase um, prints of Jyoti's uh, works. And that is the, the website, So Sacred Art, S-O sacredart.com. Uh, where you can see the paintings that she's done and the paintings she, she's done with her husband, Ramdas, Hari Ramdas. And, uh, you know, I, I'm really excited because um, I, I decided I wanted to get one of your paintings for my wife for Christmas. And uh, and when Raghunath heard about it, he said, I'll pitch in and help you pay for it too. So uh, <laughs> I mentioned this on the show the other day. Raghunath was so nice to do that. But uh, one of my favorite paintings in the world and my wife's favorite paintings is a painting you did called Brothers which is a painting of Krishna and Balaram out in the pastures with what just seems like thousands and thousands of beautiful cows. Right? Yes. And oh, so, yeah, it's wonderful. Is that yeah. one of, is that one of your most requested paintings? It is. It is. And that's one of the more recent ones as well. Yeah. That was done for, uh, as a gift, uh, someone commissioned us to do is a gift for, um, New Mayapur temple. Oh, fact, okay. Wow. Because their main deities are Krishna Balaram. So we could find the original there. Yes. And it's okay. quite large. And um, that was that what you mentioned, you know, all the cows, that was Ram's vision that they're coming back from Govardhan. The distance is Govardhan. Yeah. Thousands of cows, which are just, you know, yeah. these small indications to... But you really get that feeling, I think, that they're, they're coming back home to the village after a day of herding the, the cows and the calves. Yes. Which is one of, anyway, we'll talk more about this, but really, you know, <laughs> ev evoking sentiments, right? Like that's one of the most, um, I, I don't know really what word to use, but like the sentiment of like, I'm waiting for Krishna to come back. I'm waiting for Krishna to come back. That that, that, that feeling of separation in, in the moment that that union is about to happen again. Uh, can be evoked through art, and and that's why I'm so grateful to artists like yourself who um, who give us these what Srila Prabhupada called windows to the spiritual world, right? They, they give us a vision of um, of of what we can't see, what we're trying to meditate on, what we're hearing about in these books, uh, reading about in Srimad Bhagavatam. But to have that visual representation aids the meditation so much. But before we get into all that, talking about art in general and, and the role that it plays in bhakti. Uh, let's just hear a little bit about your life. It, it, it's mentioned in your bio that at the age of five, you're introduced to art. My older sister was, she's much older. She was nine years older. So she was already involved in art. And uh, later she went to art, uh, in art school and she always left her materials around. She was lovely and always encouraged me. So I just decided that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> Uh, right. It was pretty much set. I was by seven. I was like, okay, this is what I want. Amazing. Amazing. You know, when oh. people said, what do you want to be when you grow up? That was my answer. An artist. Yeah. Even from that age. Amazing. Yeah. Mara, I just need to mention you. I don't think you put this up on Facebook yet. Have you? I'm trying, but I'm running into a problem. Oh, okay. <laughs> <You're on. laughs> Sorry. Okay, I'm working no, on no. it. <laughs> Hopefully we'll go up on Facebook soon. Okay. So, so you're introduced at five and you were born in, in Poland. At what age did you move to Brooklyn, New York? Five. At, oh, so right then. Yes. Okay. And so then from there you studied at, at different important uh, art schools in New York as you were growing up. Yes. Later. Um, oh. You know, in the early years, you just go to public school in your neighborhood and, and such. Yeah. But then there was the opportunity, which I don't even know if they do that still anymore, but you could go, there were two art schools in Manhattan. There was music and art, yeah. which my sister attended, and then there was art and design. And maybe because my sister went to the other one, I decided to go to, to art and design. And that, that little decision changed my whole life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, because there I met this group of kids who were into going to the Hare Krishna temple. So you're like 16 or 17 at this point? 16, yes. 16, 16 I believe. Um, I met um, Satyaraj, who was yeah. Steve, and him, and there was another group. They were older than me, a little older, and they used to bring 
prashadam on Monday from leftover from the Sunday feast. Uh-huh. And distribute it in the cafeteria. No kidding. It was, and, and it was quite a draw. Really? Yes. Was, now, was Satyaraj one of the cool kids in the school? <laughs> um, because he's Be listening. Honest. Yes. yes <laughs> okay. yes, yes. He must have been. He was, you know, ahead of his time. I've seen yeah. photos of him from back then. Yeah. No. Kind of blow me away, right? He got long <laughs> hair and he was a yeah. blues guitarist and all that. And so, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, he, so he loved that philosophy stuff. He loved to talk right. about lofty things. And so you would sit around at the at the cafeteria table and start like going back and forth about life and death and reincarnation. Exactly. And like exactly. And we would argue and debate and went round and round. And then I remember after a while of this, he said, why don't you come to the Sunday feast? Just come. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, I'm not interested in that stuff. You know, even after all the talking, because I used to see the devotees in, in Manhattan all the time. And it was not attraction. It was just <laughs> so you'd see the boys doing kirtan out the in the time. streets and it didn't oh, turn you on? No. Okay. I was really, really, really focused on art. I really had no other dimension. <laughs> okay. But then he but brought he you said, to the temple, which I assume was the Henry Street Temple in Brooklyn. Right. He said, why don't you just come? Just come. So I went with a girlfriend and I don't know what happened. Okay. I walked through the door and it was, that was love at first sight. I really? just was like stunned. I don't know why. Radha Govinda, the deities in the temple or just the atmosphere in the temple, oh, the people? Yes. I remember distinctly walking through the door, the front door and you walking through the front door is sort of a hallway on the side is the, um, the temple room door. That wasn't yeah. open yet. And I just remember the incense, the flowers mm. and a few particular devotees who were uh, sitting there that I don't know. And then when I went, then there was Artik and I went and I don't know, Radha Govinda, um, <laughs> the mood, the happiness. Yeah. It just totally blew me away. And I was, I came with a friend. She was not interested. She was not happy. To be there. No. And, um, I remember looking at her and looking at all the other devotees, and I thought, I want to be with them. <laughs> I was I be with them. kind of a uh, feeling all of a sudden. Interesting. And, Some uh, awakening in your heart at that like, moment. Right away. And, wow. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think so, in my, just my own personal, uh, I don't know, impressions that I have of the history of the Krishna consciousness movement seeing entering into the henry street temple in, in that time seems to me like one of the most fascinating eras there you know to, to enter into because it was is you know relatively small building packed, packed with young but it seems to me like uh it was like a quite an array of dynamic young people mm-hmm. uh that were you know creative and dynamic brilliant in so many different ways also a little wild you know a bit of reckless youth abandoned diving into this you know um eastern tradition uh but uh it just seems like there's an incredible amount of creativity and dynamic energy coming from that temple at that time well the press was there yeah so they're printing Prabhupada's books there so it was a perfect um fit for me there was one uh, floor, they, they called it the gallery. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's there was a stage in there. And then there was a gallery. There were the, all the paintings that were uh, being painted at the time would be, then later be displayed in the gallery. And I remember just staying in there for hours. But, so so because the it, so for people that don't understand the Bhaktivinoda the Book Trust, they had their press there. They're they're actually producing the books there. Producing, yes. And which means they needed paintings for all those books, too. That's right. Which so means... Ronnie was you, there, Early Dar was there, Parikit was there. Bardvaj was there at that time, too? He had just left. Okay. So I didn't meet him to Los Angeles. He had, okay. he had already gone to India and, uh, work, you know, his department for the dolls, the doll making, the okay. dioramas was starting. So as a 17-year-old young aspiring artist did you f- completely freak your parents out by moving into that bizarre <laughs> Hare krishna temple in brooklyn well actually i didn't move into that temple okay you never did okay. i was still a child <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um so i 
the arrangement was I would finish high school. I would mm. finish school. And then by that time, um, the press, the BBT press, you know, the whole, the whole press was, had moved to, by the spring, had moved to Los Angeles. It must have outgrown that space, I assume. Yes, there was an, the actual press was in another place called Tiffany Place. Okay. And it was, but it was, you know, that most, many, many devotees worked there. Anyway, so mm -hmm. then the whole process went to Los Angeles. It was a larger facility. And so. Um, you, you graduated was, from high school and headed to the and, West Coast and followed my, it out there. Yes. And bought my ticket and um, Never I came back. Yeah, I arrived and they dropped me off at, at Jadarani's studio and she was expecting me. Um, was she kind of the, like the matriarch of the art team or something yes, like that? Yes, you bet, you bet. Okay. And um, she said, uh, you know, I was so excited. I was still 17 and she said, are you hungry? And I said, no, she said, good. And she handed me a paintbrush. <laughs> End of life. I had no, that was right in the midst of Chaitanya Charitamrita marathon. Okay. So, so I had so no. Let's explain that too. So you, you're 17 years old when you arrived there. Yes. Okay. And at that point in history, what had happened was Srila Prabhupada was translating Srimad Bhagavatam all along, but simultaneously he began to, to translate another book and, and comment on another book called Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. Another, you know, it's a, quite a work it's you know a lengthy work it was published in 17 volumes i believe and um he was moving faster than the book production team and in other words he was translating and writing commentaries faster than they could produce the books and at a certain point he got a little strong with him and said hey come on you know it's <laughs> like you know i'm doing the hard work here why don't you guys produce these books you know i need you to produce them faster and he more or less said i want you to finish the entire chaitanya chartamrita which may have been 10 more volumes or more than that at that point a lot in yeah a lot <laughs> okay he wanted uh, he wanted them to produce all those books i think he gave them three months to do it is that right yes maximum was it okay. two or three months it was insane it was some unbelievable and, at the and, before that there would be a volume of bhagatam put out like every three or four months one okay right so now in three months, he wanted to produce like 17. 10 or 12 or something like that volumes. And um, it was within a conversation, I believe it was Rameshwar uh, Prabhu who was heading up the BBT at that time when Prabhupada said that he said, Prabhupada, that's impossible. Right. And Prabhupada shared the famous phrase at that time. Impossible is a word in a fool's dictionary? Yeah, impossible is a word in the fool's dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> right. So for Bhakti Yogi, right, we understand by God's grace, anything can be done. So uh, at that point, you stepped right into uh, I was what, what I assume was like an atmosphere of like, um, well, why don't you describe it? What was the atmosphere? It's like? just a frenzy. They had already, you know, designed uh, schedules. So there was 24 hour schedules. There were, you know, it, it was just constant constant so 24 hour schedules of of both everything. i assume editing and everything um, was going well painting four hours so there was you know all these and so let's say it was 12 volumes and each volume let's say had about 10 paintings and something like you need like over 100 paintings like within three months or something like that it was crazy yes it was crazy. <laughs> okay. and it was very uh, <laughs> again i had never and and this is the whole this whole style of painting personally i you know, I just came from art school where usually you had a subject, you had something you were painting from, um, from life, some, you know. There was a model of, or. Uh, something like that. Here, create something. You read something and now create the, this painting. And these were full-blown oil paintings. They were not, you know, quick little illustrations with in pencil. Yeah. They were oil paintings that were, you know, needed to be wonderful right and um you know there was already i had jumped in there was already a standard so <laughs> there were a number of pressures upon me um, and so so I, i'm curious to hear about um 
the the people in that art department <laughs> um you know in other words because again from my own i don't know romantic way of looking back at the time i, I admire Pearl Potts disciples um i admire these people that gave their lives so wholly you know so completely um to serve uh under the circumstances that so you know different devotees found themselves in all around the world uh but I, this art department to me is a unique group of individuals you know a group of artists that um that, that suddenly just you know had, had this mission to create this very beautiful art art that's changed my life and changed the lives of so many of our listeners um what and, and you know maybe there's always like a tension between the artistic type of person and the less so and how that could play out like in a a new religious movement in a sense you know must have been very interesting i wonder how other devotees looked at this group of people and were you different in certain ways but what was what were those people like and what was it like for you to meet these people as a young aspiring devotee as well as an artist uh first i would say they were, they were totally dedicated hmm. they they really did give their life and their creativity and their vision they they wholeheartedly gave and that was always in the forefront to make Prabhupada's books most beautiful and to please him. And, you know, when he would get a, a book, the first thing he would do is look at the paintings, the mm. new paintings. Now he had already been seeing perhaps, uh, you know, some of the sketches. We always sent out um, questions beforehand. There was all kinds of things before, but he also was thrilled to see the paintings. And that was our goal as everyone's was to get that smile. Mm -hmm. Srila Prabhupada. So they were just dedicated. Now within that, um, there is perhaps some artistic temperament and um, even competition. It's would, it's, you know, <laughs> uh, but ultimately that was put aside. And I think that made this group so unusual and unique that you could forego some of that you know i'm sure you've seen so, so in other words there might be petty kind of stuff between artists and you're able well, to just, transcend that or? yes you know just imagine you're working on a painting and there's a deadline and they are go they are going to take away the painting because there's a deadline to for printing it needs to be done there, there could be a, a, you know, a bombardment of artists working. I'm sure you've seen the photographs of three or four artists working at the same time on, on, one, painting. on one painting. You have to give up stuff. You have to give up your, <laughs> right. you know, your personal ego things for the ultimate uh, purpose. You know, purpose. Yeah, yeah. And that went on. And, you know, after when they want to say, you know, it started, I jumped in into the middle of this marathon, but then when, when Srila Prabhupada saw that, oh, the speed can be quite fast. Mm -hmm. The marathon kind of didn't end. Okay. <laughs> right. So it, that speed more or less was maintained. A little, it was loosened a little bit, but. He, I, I think he actually squeezed um, volumes of Bhagavatam into that marathon too. Yes, it's Canto. That was my second painting. Yes. Wow. Wow. Yes, it was, it was, uh, it was challenging. And, and again, you know, staying up because of the different schedules, you know, it was pretty much, um, you know, Mongol Arctic, Japa, paint, and repeat. Right. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure as particularly you were probably the youngest of these artists, I'm assuming. Yes. <laughs> so some of them must have became important friends and guides to you. In your life maybe not <laughs> they were yes well or examples were, to you maybe yes they were maybe mentors and ex yes they were examples and um i think i was too young to be friends uh-huh you know we were um co-workers co i don't want to say workers you know we were together in this mission yeah co do this Yes. So um, I, I, I mean, I learned from them the example of, of dedication. Guru Seva, like that, dedication. The to was just 
focused. There was no, no, no swaying. And she was, you know, my, my associate for a long time, you know, in very close quarters. So I learned from her, also her stories about Prabhupada. She would just, you know, nothing, you know, they were amazing. Very, she was there from the earliest days. Earliest days and, and truly Prabhupada treated her like a daughter and, uh, you know, instructed her in so many things in the art and also just, you know, how to put on a sari. Right. <laughs> things, you know, yeah. um, and that was, oh, another thing that was constant, constant in the art department was um, constant uh, classes or chanting of Srila Prabhupada. It was mm. on the loudspeaker system. Mm. So you become, you know, um, imbued, would that be the mm -hmm. right word? You know, just filled with... Um, it was a very deep immersion into, yes. into seva, into service. And... Yes, and that was, that was what I learned there. And then all the, the whole BBT had a certain mood that was very, very thick, you know. We were all, and we felt very closely connected to Srila Prabhupada because his books were so dear to him. Mm. So we were felt like on his team. Right. Well, I wanted to ask you about that. Um, there must have been times where you were brought into a room with other artists into Srila Prabhupada's room and sat down there as he commented on the paintings? That happened a few times. Uh, you know, I, I came in 75, so then he came to Los Angeles, and that's exactly what we did to his quarters. And I would, my overall experience of that, he was uh, at that meeting, he was getting his afternoon massage. And I felt like he, he enjoyed that experience of seeing, he was very relaxed and enjoyed seeing the artwork. Mm. Um, and, I felt that love, you know, I felt that uh, reciprocation, that this was something um, I felt very, very fortunate to be a part of um, because I saw how much joy it brought him. It, it must have felt like a great privilege to be in that room with him. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was so personal. I could, you know, and I was a young devotee, a young person to be in a very, it's actually a very small room, his quarters, uh, this particular room. And we were just sitting around. He was getting his massage and, and and commenting on the paintings and you know who did what and you hold it up and he gets yeah. to see you know. Yeah, you know I, I want to mention because uh, you know the Budra Purnima there was a Budra Purnima campaign in September to uh, distribute sets of Srimad Bhagavatam. I think altogether or globally, over thirty five thousand sets of Srimad Bhagavatam are distributed. And uh, here on Wisdom of the Sages, our own listeners, I think they donated like 55 sets of Bhagavatam. And I think 60, around 65 of our listeners in our audience received free sets of Bhagavatam. And, and, as, and they're just arriving now, like within the past week or so, everyone's like the sets are showing up at people's homes. They, they arrive home and there's a big box that says, you know, a big cardboard box that says <laughs> Shreem Bhagavatam on the outside. And they... And, you know, like a lot of our listeners have never even seen a set of Srimad Bhagavatams before, you know. They've just been listening to the podcast. So they open up that box and it's like, um, you know, the, we're, we're, I'm getting so many heartfelt, you know, messages. Of, it's just like, my God, it's just glowing. You know, it's just like I open up that box and these books are just amazing. And, and so much of that, of course, is due to the, to the paintings, uh, many of which are your own in there. So uh, we're also grateful to you. Um, I'm interested now to talk more about art in general, um, and maybe, but maybe we can begin by speaking about it in the context of how you understood as not only an artist, but as a disciple and servant of this great Bhakti Yogi, Srila Prabhupada, trying to convey his idea of art, or, or maybe I should ask it like this. Through Srila Prabhupada, how did you understand your role of an artist, or what is the role of art? You know, just like Srila Prabhupada titled Bhagavad Gita, as it is. Hmm. And I think that is the key, that he wanted Krishna as he is, 
And that's why he clearly said in letters and in, in words, he wanted Krishna real. He didn't want, in, in many times Krishna is understood as mythology, as folklore, as these other things, rather than an actual personality that was present, the personality of Godhead that was present in Vrindavan on earth on doing these activities or in Goloka, you know, not, not some imagination. And so that was really um, embedded in, in what I understood in what he tried to convey. And that is, is still my, my focus and, and my goal, you know, and what does that mean? that he's transcendental, but still walking and playing and doing all his uh, activities in Leela. What does that mean? And how does that look? Mm. You know, so, so Srila Prabhupada, want, like in others, here's a person that's trying to bring the culture of Bhakti and the culture of Krishna to the Western world. And he's, he's, his books, in one sense, are the primary way of doing that. And he wants art in all those books which is an unusual thing. It's not like every other guru that was coming over from India was like asking for paintings. I think Prabhupada was a visionary. Yeah. I think he knew, I mean, he established an art, artist, you know, Jadarani from the earliest days before they had a temple, right? before they had anything really uh, substantial. And I think that was his, one of his many, many brilliances that he saw that this would be a way to communicate, to attract, and to also trademark this movement. Mm. And as if you, you know, even historically, every religious, large religious movement has their art. And he didn't, you know, leave us out. So, uh, so you know, I visited Rome, um, this right. past September, and as I'm going through there and going through the Vatican Museum and and go, oh, just all over every church in every corner, there's a church. And um, I said to myself, my goodness, if there were a city in anywhere in the world that had this level of art in terms of Krishna Bhakti, it would change the whole world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can still feel. I feel, you know, we lived in Italy for six years, and I loved going into uh, the churches and chanting japa because to me they were i felt the holiness the sacredness of, yeah. of those places because those artists also oftentimes had a similar bhakti mm -hmm. to their devotional art sure and they sacrificed and they were often <laughs> didn't have the best of uh, lives really they really dedicated themselves to this and um and I think that was amazing that Prabhupada saw it as valuable, yeah. so valuable to incorporate it into his books. And and you mentioned a few reasons why that would be important. Um, but it's, it occurs to me that another reason that it's important, you, you mentioned trademarking it and you know how it would attract people and so on. But also in terms of one's own practice, right? Like in terms of one's own meditation, uh, you know, as bhakti yogis, we, we're not trying to empty our minds. But we're trying to focus the mind and mm -hmm. normally we say that's on the name the qualities the pastimes and the form of god mm -hmm. right that's what we meditate on so it seems to me like he was asking if i'm understanding from you correctly he was asking for like realism in the art realism in the style so that we could i guess it, it generates a certain kind of faith like don't think these are just stories this is something that actually is existing right now and i want to grant you a vision of that through the Absolutely. painting Absolutely. Just like when you go to Vrindavan, Krishna did this here, Krishna did this here, all these places. Hmm. So those are the places we need to have a vision of, of the personalities who, who did those activities hmm. and a believable one. Right. You know, we're, we're three-dimensional. We have um, light and dark. We have proportion we have you know so many things right so if if you know to be able to incorporate all those uh, skills all those things into the vision 
into the words. We have the amazing descriptions. We have details that are unbelievable. And now to use them and uh, incorporate them into a visual experience. Yeah. We, you know, I, I mentioned to you, I mentioned at the beginning here that, um, you know, for, for my wife, I'm, it's, it's not only for her, right? it's my apartment too, but uh, for, for Christmas, I wanted to get her this painting. And it's this, it's just such a beautiful painting. I, I'll, I'll put this out there again. If you go to so sacred art.com also, if you go, for, if you look for sacred art on um, Instagram and on Facebook, you'll, you'll find your Tidasi's art there. When that painting is in the home, it actually changes the, it, it changes the atmosphere in the room. But it also gives you know I'm just I'm just realizing like for the rest of my life I can sit before that painting, and it can it it gives me a, a visual focus and a mental focus, and it kind of um it's a way of gradually through meditation on it through thinking of it uh, softening the heart in a way and and and, and opening my heart up to sent to, to the sentiments of a bhakti yogi, um, and the realism is important in that. Now, w w before the show, you and I were speaking about other forms of devotional art, like other styles of painting that depict Krishna Bhakti. And I mentioned two in particular. One is the Rajasthani style, uh, which, you know, like, you, for instance, I would assume people would say the master of that was B.G. Sharma. Would you agree? Amazing. Yes. You know, widely recognized like that. Um, and I also mentioned another style of art, like the Kerala style of art, which you see in the temples in Kerala, which is uh, another unique style. Um, of of art, kind of I don't know, very earthy kind of tones and uh, and you know, a very far out style um, that commonly used to depict Mahabharata and Ramayana and, and other gods and goddesses and so on. Now, sh please, uh, you shared with me, but I'll ask you to share for our audience the how you personally feel about that art or um, why you paint in a different style. I think that art is beautiful. It's traditional. There's you know centuries of practice in there, and some I'm sure were some of the artists were devotional, but there's a certain um, flatness to all of them. And uh, Ram and I, we we kind of concluded we were trying to wonder uh, understand why did they always go to this kind of flat. Um, Place. Flat by flat, you mean, in other words, there's the, no perspective. There's the, no, okay. there, there, it's like in one plane. Yeah. And I think, you know, we, we would think that. Do you, let they, me ask this question before you. Do you see, do you see any traditional painting style of bhakti that doesn't go there? Are there? It, it came later. There were a few artists, um, not necessarily bhakti, you know, Indian artists. Okay. Like, um, what's his name? Ravi. Varma. Varma. And that was kind of amazing. He struck, he was breaking through. Then right. there was, uh, and there was a Western influence in his painting. Yes. And, and you saw more and more of that. And he would depict, depict the, you know, um, the traditional pastimes and things also. Right. And some were amazing. Some were very beautiful. And I, I find more of a attraction to that. Um, he was attempting that. Right. Okay. And, but that and, was much later. That's not like the, the the more traditional art. Right. And I, I think also, you know, even in Western art, the older, like century, you know, uh, 14, 1500s, the art as well in Europe as well was quite flat. It was almost before they developed or understood or were awakened to perspective. Right. Once that door was open, they they went for it, and all kinds of things opened up. And um, who was the painter? I was just, whose whose art is in the the churches in Assisi? Yes, it starts Very with a J, good. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was trying to pick. I, to pick um, I forget how to pronounce it. Later. Yes. Huh? Giotto. Giotto. Yeah. Very good. All yes, right. exactly. <laughs> yes, that was a turning point. Right. And then you know continued, and then you know Leonardo did huge steps. You know, in all, all those different one different artists, they had their contributions. Okay. 
So and you were saying, I interrupted you, but you and your husband Ramdas were looking at this traditional art. That they were trying to also depict the sacred. So Krishna's is is um, divine. He's not ordinary, and so he can't be in the background. He always has to be in the foreground. And and then you know the different personalities. They also have to be in the foreground. So then you get this whole foreground, and you don't, you can't enter. To me personally, I can't enter in oh, okay. and get lost into the ins and outs of a, a pastime or a, you know, a scene. I get it. In other words, it's 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 not that it can't inspire devotion, but it's like you're standing outside looking at someone else's devotion rather than entering into that world. Yes, you're you're looking at it. Yeah. You're not entering in, and that. Um, personally, that is very much a part of what I and and also what Ram we we really aspired to was how to enter into the pastimes. Prabhupada would even speak like that. This is a way. This process of bhakti is a way to enter in. He would use that word. Mm. So how do we enter in visually? Um, you know, I'm sure people experience during kirtan. You enter in, you can absorb yourself and get lost in that experience. So that is my um, aspiration to get lost. I want to get lost. Mm. <laughs> you get know, lost, I, yeah. I want to see Krishna. Right. And right now would, would be nice. Mm -hmm. you know? um, I'm just saying that very flippantly, but that's really kind of like simply put, I, I want to see what that looks like. And I know I've experienced in classical art, you know, just like I've learned all the stories of Greek mythology and stuff from art books mm. because they were so in, uh, engrossing and chanting that I was like, Whoa. you look at the painting of what's the story and I have to find out. Right. So similarly, that was a goal, you know, that is, you know. Uh, well, speaking of entering in, I would like to approach that from a different angle. In other words, so far we're talking about how as an artist you create a work so that some so that the audience could enter into it. But I'm also wondering as the artist that engaged in the actual work of painting, how how do you enter into that or or I'll try to be more clear. Um as an artist, the the painting itself is an act of bhakti or you could say it is a meditation. So as a bhakti yogi, how has being a paint, let me frame it this way, I'll share something with you, is that I once interviewed a Odissi dancer and um, she she occasionally dances in the Radharaman temple, which is really, you know, like in one sense, a center of culture in Vrindavan and um, a center of, of bhakti culture and even more specifically Gaudiya Vaishnava bhakti culture. Um, and she, so it's an ancient temple and she, she has the privilege to dance there in front of the deity of Krishna Radha Raman. Um, and I asked her, what is it like to dance in the Radha Raman temple in front of Radha Raman? And specifically, what is it like to dance playing the role of Radha in front of Krishna in that temple? And she said something interesting to me. She said, she said, you know, to, to dance, um, in the role of Krishna, is relatively easy she said you know he's naughty he's here and he's heroic and you know he's doing these she said but to understand radha and to dance as radha when i was given that task she said i didn't know what to do i was it was a total mystery how do i convey radha's moods and she said that she they're really it, the, the process that she had to undertake in order to try to understand that, she said, was prayer. And she said, I just had to pray very deeply for a long time to try for that, that Krishna or Radha would bless me in some way to understand. And she felt like, and eventually in some way they gave me a little something, and it was that that I worked with. So I saw for her that um, it's, in one sense, you know, the audience will see that dance and benefit from it, and, and, the, and the dance will bring their mind to Radha and Krishna, but for, but probably for no one more so than, than the artist herself. The, the, the demand that the art, you know, called out of her 
must have been a very intense practice. So I'm wondering, as a painter, uh, particularly in the style that you do, which is this realistic style, uh, what is it like for you as a bhakti yogi, that practice? Um, first, I would like to say, you know, as an Art for the artist is already absorbing. It's already uh, something that's a part of them. They can, um, I don't know, it's just so deeply embedded in them. Yeah. And then to layer it again with this spiritual um, angle, the spiritual side, it only intensifies it and brings it closer to the heart it becomes um, an attempt to go deeper within myself, you know? And each painting, and I will call that call it that, is an attempt. I'm just, again, trying. Hmm. And maybe, maybe there's some tiny drop of success, but there's not really. It's never, I never reach it. And just that process, keeps me uh, uh, keeps me there you know I can't get away from it and it absorbs me and I would say my my prayer there's my prayer is not to get in the way <laughs> you know oh is to somehow it's a little hard to explain, you know, to leave an avenue open that perhaps Krishna in the heart or something will, could come out because I think in all ability, Krishna says, I'm the ability in man, mm -hmm. he, he comes out, it's his gift, you know, whether it's through in a bhakti tradition or in amazing art, all kinds of creations. This is all Krishna's energy. So when we're closer connected to him, as I hope we are trying uh -huh. to be, yeah. um, I pray for that. I pray for that uh, intelligence, that ability, that sensitivity, um, the emotion, a zillion things to, to somehow come out. So um, I do address, I do approach the studios as my sacred place. Um, the easel is my altar. And then I try to create the deity. Prophet said this is deity worship. Hmm. So that is pretty, and before I start, and you must know, I, you know, I offer incense. I, there's a little bit of a ritual for me to get in that frame of mind. I try to, you know, um, bring in that, that type of sound vibration, just like we used to do in the art department, um, to understand the sacredness of it. Um, I never, the, the paintings are, are, are like deities. Hmm. So they never go on the floor. There's always something, and this is, you know, this was the, the procedure in the art department from those early days. This is what I learned, that they are parts of Krishna. Oh. You know, Krishna can be present in them. And if we just get out of the way, in other words, right? Yes. Yeah, w yes. which is, I, I guess, the it's a similar meditation for anyone, whether they're speaking, yes. you know, Krishna philosophy, whether they're decorating a deity in a temple, whether yes. they're just trying to help others, uh, in their bhakti in whatever way they do in one sense it, it seems like that's um, that's key to it I, may my own ego get out of the way and may become an instrument um, I think we used to use this term in the olden days it might be a uh, to be a transparent via medium and that's right yeah. that. <laughs> uh, in the days. Um, yes and and it's unlimited the possibilities are unlimited and it also makes me very attached and interested in it. And um, like I what said- What do you mean by that? The possibilities are unlimited? Possibilities of depicting Krishna are unlimited. So each time I don't know what's gonna happen. 
And you know, it's interesting that yeah. you say that because when I read Prabhupada's, like I, people can read them, that there's letters that Prabhupada wrote to BBT uh, representatives where he's giving instruction on how to paint the different paintings. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd imagine to some, they might feel that his instructions were limiting Right. You just use the word unlimited, but it seems like, you know, he, he was kind of uh, creating a certain framework that he wanted the artists to work within. And I think that's just the, uh, the guideline is framework. Mm -hmm. Just like with all art, there are rules. And I can, you can show me any painting. I'll tell you all kinds of rules that went right. into that. Right. The uh, great rule, artist. Yeah. Yes. Rules, discipline. Um, Okay. <laughs> you know, it didn't I should, happen. I can guarantee you. I've, um, I've, yeah, it didn't happen it, very, no. without without discipline and so on. A lot. Yeah. A lot. Like sometimes people go, oh, uh, you know, how how do you do that? I go, oh, I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> you know, I, I've shared this story once before, I think, on our podcast. But uh, my friend, you know, and co-host Raghunath, he was he was serving and kind of being trained by my guru Tamal Krishna Goswami for for a period of time long time ago and um and my guru it, it would kind of like uh in a, in a in a loving way kind of like um uh tease him sometimes and about his music because he's in a punk rock band you know at that time and he and he would say you're that is not music that you're playing you know it's and and uh and Raghunath said something like well, well come on like what about like you know that's art you know like what about Picasso like you know his, his style and, and my guru said first he learned to, to be a, you know a master then he first he learned to master rules then he broke the rules right true it's absolutely true you can look at literally it is true you can yeah. see early paintings of Picasso he's quite skilled yeah. he could you know pull things off and let and that's a great great uh, thought um I just want to say that, you know, the, the discipline and the meditation and the devotion that you described and others in your process, it's not that you just wake up and roll out of bed and start painting. There's, you, ha you have to get in the, you, you have to invoke the right devotion, just as a pujari will do. You know, even like you'll see this in India, the pujaris, they'll, they'll sit and do pranayama before they do their puja because they want to, they, they want to let go of the ego. They want to let go of anything that's in the way so that they can do that seva right. And I feel that in your art. In other words, when I look at your art, to me, that trans, that, that quality of transparency that, that you mentioned, in other words, that there's nothing in between God and me when I look at this painting, right? There's no ego there or anything. I can, I can feel that. And, uh, you know, which reminds me of uh, this, and it's again, something that I mentioned to other, even like musicians that we've had on the show before. Um, Tolstoy's definition of art, which where he said that this is what art is. It, the artist has a particular emotion. They express that emotion through the work of art. And when the audience, through the work of art, experiences the emotion that the artist had, then that transfer of emotion from, from the artist through the work to the audience, that is called art and nothing else is art. <laughs> right? So even if you're a very skilled painter uh, or very skilled musician or whatever, you know, there are musicians that are very skillful and they're putting out lots of music, but they're not exactly honestly conveying an emotion that is transferred to the audience. But when that's done, that's called art. And that's like such a powerful transferal that it captivates people, you know, throughout history. Mm -hmm. But when that's done within the context of bhakti, it's so special. Mm -hmm. Because what we're talking about is conveying the, the, the sentiments and the emotions that are spiritual and by spiritual let's be more specific that are our inherent spiritual nature right and, and ultimately that that is divine love so it's really the highest purest um most special of all sentiments are being conveyed through that artwork and when you step into a temple you can feel that in so many ways right like whether even in the architecture in the paintings that are there in um, the music that's being played, you know, that was composed by a great saint to express their emotion and then being sung by a singer who's also investing the emotion in the temple, in the, the, the deities, in the carving of the, the deities, in the decoration of the temples and in all of that. In one sense, Bhakti is about connecting, you know, someone's heart mm -hmm. being expressed in a particular way and reaching your heart. Beautifully said. Well, yes. you do it. You do it. You do it. You do it so well. I thought maybe we, I could ask you one last question because you mentioned something to me the other day that I thought was interesting. If I understood you correctly, 
Um, and that is that you don't necessarily, in order, so you've described in, in a sense how your service of painting devotional art is your own meditation and is your own art, it is your seva, it is your meditation. Um, but I might not be a great artist. I might not have picked this up from five years old and gone to the schools you've gone through and done all the discipline you've done. Do you, do you encourage anyone or everyone to try to be an artist? Absolutely. Like we were, we were discussing that people don't seem to have a problem picking up some kartals and, mm. and chanting or singing a nice bhajan or something. And I feel it's the same way. It can also be another expression or, or some people perhaps write poetry or, you know, about their feelings. This is just an, an avenue to express um, your feelings, your bhakti, your, your thoughts. And the wonderful thing, an a magical thing about bhakti is whatever, wherever, whatever you're thinking, whatever you're doing, or, or even just thinking about it, that's already seva. You're already connected. Mm. So maybe the execution isn't possible or isn't that perfect, that's still acceptable because it's the, the heart, isn't it? It's the, yeah. the, um, the and the mood. mind, right? Bringing the mind to it. Right? Yes. Or the mind and the heart in one sense, we're talking about the same thing. Yes. So wow. absolutely. Now, um, because this is my uh, world, it has been my world my whole life now, really. Yeah. Um, there are, if someone wanted to delve deeper, there are parameters. And um, because, you know, I'm a disciple of Prabhupada, he is my uh, guide through right. that. So sometimes I see depictions of Krishna or something that are just a little outlandish uh, for my uh, acceptance. Right. And I would like to, you know, if I could, I would probably say something. You know, right. To yeah. Encourage to go in that direction if possible. But better than to throw in the whole towel, you know, better than throw in the whole thing, you know, is better just to do it than not do it. Just like where it might be imperfect in chanting or in japa or in so many things, better to do it. And then better still is to try to get better. <laughs> right, right. You know, but perfect. Yeah, right. And I, 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 you know, in, in that vein, you know, before I get to painting, there's a lot of thinking that goes on and kind of that thinking goes on all day. And it, it comes out in, you know, I could just be looking at a scene and, you know, perhaps a, a sunlight or something. And I'm already trying to put it into my library of for future use. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, right. So it keeps it, you, it, it can keep one 24 hours a day yes. thinking of God. Right? Yes, it is. And it's amazing. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. You know, before, <laughs> before we end, I want to again bring people's attention to where they can find your art. I really encourage people. You know, you have, there's a whole array of your artwork that you did with your husband, Ram Das Habiram. Um, you can find it at the website sosacredart.com. And it's available in this very high quality type of print, right? How, how is that? A G clay. G clay. You know, I really wanted to steer away from posters and kind of cheap, you know, reproductions. So the G clay process is the closest, you know, next to the original. Which is a high quality print on canvas. On, on artist canvas that, you know, when it's stretched and presented, uh, treated just like an oil painting, hmm. then, you know, that's the best I've found um, to, to display. Right. You know, and your paintings are keep, available. Sorry, just to keep this whole mood in in the fine art uh, category was my dream. <laughs> right, right. And, and so then um, your paintings are available there uh, and in different sizes at different 
prices, right? So, so yeah. that you yeah. can get it the size Indeed. that fits nice according to your budget and according to your the space that you want to share that yeah. in. It can be, you know, usually custom. They're not set. They're all uh, ordered per uh, piece. So even beyond those sizes, if someone reaches out to you through through the either through Instagram or through the website, you can help customize it. Yes. I think you even sometimes will paint uh, detail on top yes. of the. Printing. Oh yes, yeah. <laughs> wow, so oh, it really yes. pops. You, you get, yes, well, so you get a one of a kind. You see, that's a one of a kind, that's, and the artist touch. Yeah, and, and and I guess the the just the point that I want to share with the audience is. Don't don't think of it as just like um de home decoration, but um, you know it's a bit of an investment, but it's an investment that's in one sense life changing to have that painting in your home is it's it's almost like bringing god into your home it is like bringing god into your home and and um it can it can change the atmosphere of your home and it can elevate your consciousness for your entire life and for your family and for whoever you bring there so it's not just like it's not like we're like these art collectors trying to impress people or something this is this is something that's um it's just it's it's right there at the core of, of practice i want to bring my mind to Krishna and to Krishna's pastimes. And it's a very dynamic and powerful way to do it. So I encourage people, you know, it's even, even these paintings are worshipable themselves. You know, it's like you can, you can offer arti and, and really like offer your heart to God through uh, this manifestation, this particular manifest, very special, beautiful, realistic, uh, <laughs> spiritual manifestation. So Jyoti Dasi, it's been a real pleasure to have you here. Um, <laughs> I, I, I thank you for taking the time and getting up earlier on the West Coast and, and uh, sharing all that you shared with us today. Thank you. It was, it was, uh, it was very uh, eye-opening for me, too. I get to delve in and analyze things. Great. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. And I'm just uh, dying, waiting for that painting to arrive. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll keep it posted. Thank okay, you. thank you. Very Thank you, Hare Krishna. All right, everybody. So uh, that's it for today. But as Mara mentioned earlier, what are, what's happening today, Mara? Uh, Shloka Group is meeting now, and then Bhakti Recovery Group meets at 9.30. Bhakti and Recovery also, we group should announce now. there's no show tomorrow. That's right. Good point. No show tomorrow. Raghunath is traveling. I need a break. But <laughs> we'll see you at uh, 8 a.m. Eastern Time on Tuesday to continue Shrimad Bhagavatam. Thank you, everybody. And now's the time for our dance cam. Especially, we'd like to begin with the younger dancers amongst our our crowd here. 